Good morning slash fireside stage. How's everyone doing this morning? Up bright and early? Can I get a little round of applause if you are out late? Very good. Me too. Um, so I have here um, a very uh, special guest, Jan Tallinn, who is the founding engineer of Skype and Kazaa, and one of the leading thinkers on uh, AI and existential risk. Um, I, for my part, um, am not nearly as impressive, but am here to help Jan um, explain some pretty complex topics to you. Um, so maybe let's just quickly start. Jan, could you give us a brief introduction to who you are, um, what you did, what you're doing now? Yeah. I, uh I made Skype, <laughs> is something that I uh, sometimes uh, say, uh, uh, among other people. And um, after Skype, uh, for the last almost decade or so, I've been uh, kind of looking at uh, what could be the big problems that uh, humanity is not paying sufficient attention to. And I found uh, the topic called existential risks, which is uh, risks from uh, uh, various adversarial developments uh, that might uh, either kill the entire human species or permanently limit our uh, future potential as one of those really relatively underappreciated topics that I'm focused on. So stuff we should be thinking about as a, a species is people working in tech as we you know, careen forward into the future, how we make sure that the future exists in a way that is compatible with people, us. Yes, so uh, uh, Martin Rees, Lord Martin Rees, who is um, my co-founder at the Cambridge Center, uh, he says this thing that, I think he's actually quoting uh, uh, Bernard Russell uh, in this, but I'm not fully sure, that there's a difference between killing 90% uh, of uh, humanity and 100% of humanity, and the difference is not 10%. Right, exactly. Well, I'm glad you're working on it. Could you, so you've sort of talked to us about what existential risk is, but Maybe tell me a little bit about how AI fits into this schema and, and why, um, when we're so seemingly far away from Terminator 2, we should be thinking about AI in the same sentence as existential risk. Right, so um, one way of looking at it is that we are witnessing a tail end of a 100,000 year period. And that 100,000 year period was so-called human era on this planet, uh, meaning that the most powerful uh, future shaping force is and was uh, the human brain. Like if you look around, everything you see here uh, went through some human brain uh, as, uh, as it, he or she was planning uh, what to do with, with, with the future. So once we are yielding uh, that power uh, to non-human minds, uh, and we're kind of doing that increasingly so, uh, but once we have systems that are as powerful as humans in controlling the environment, we are risking to lose control over the environment. And because we are very, very delicate when it comes to uh, environmental changes, uh, that's why we send robots to space, that's why, that's why we send uh, robots to highly radioactive areas, because they don't care about the environment. And we don't know, we have, still don't have a good idea how to make them care. Right. So. That segues quite nicely into my next question. So environment, we're living in a, in a, in a weird world where we have um, some interesting people governing some of the more powerful nations on the planet. Um, we face runaway extreme climate change ostensibly caused by humans, um, bioengineering, uh, nanotech, and a bunch of other stuff that is potentially quite scary and bad. Um, why are we focusing on the far future and on AI as an existential risk when we have more pressing matters that r really deserve our full attention now? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there are many answers there. One is that, uh, like, you're kind of supposed to uh, uh, chew gum and walk at the same time. Like, we, don't, we shouldn't, like, focus on one thing. Uh, is it, like, climate or is it, like, nuclear? Like, we should really focus on everything because I know, we don't exactly know what, uh, uh, what might uh, uh, hit us first. Uh, so I, I totally support uh, um, like, uh, focusing on other, uh, other areas as well. In fact, the Cambridge Center is not about AI risks just. It's, it's actually uh, also thinking about things like bio risks from synthetic biology and nuclear. Uh, but I think even then there's like a difference between, uh, between different scenarios, uh, sort of difference in impact, just like with, uh, as uh, Martin Rees said, uh, that uh, like 
there is a difference. Uh, are we talking about a bad scenario, a catastrophic scenario that actually might kill everyone? Or are we talking about merely uh, catastrophic risk? Like one, uh, uh, like the person who actually got me involved in this uh, entire thing, Eliezer Yudkowski uh, in California, he got once really cynically said that we should not get distracted uh, by catastrophic risks that uh, are so trivial that they might leave survivors. Right. Very positive worldview. Um, let's, uh, let's just assume for a second. So I'm, I want to play skeptic because I've, I've been talking to people over the last couple of days about AI and AI safety and existential risk. And, and there's been a sentiment amongst the people, at least here at Slush, that we're talking about something that's so far removed that it's just not something that deserves much attention. We're too far from actually seeing it develop in a way that is potentially um, averse to, 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 to humans. So maybe you could just sort of fill us in on the various strands of thought around timelines. So, you know, we've just seen some interesting developments with AlphaGo Zero. Um, there's a bunch of uh, really smart people working on this, to just sort of careening forwards towards the development of a general AI. Where, where do you sit amongst the fray and how, how soon we can expect something generally artificially intelligent to, to come about? I think the correct uh, the position to take there is that, uh, that there's like a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the, uh, I think people who say that like, this will like, uh, never happen or this will uh, not happen in 300 years, like, sort of, they might not realize that they're making a very, very confident prediction. Uh, there is just not enough evidence to, to uh, confidently say that this will not happen in, in 100 years, to say nothing about 300 or, or never. Uh, so they're just wrong uh, just to say that. Uh, Unless they know something that, that uh, like people that I, that I talk to at DeepMind and OpenAI, et cetera, don't. Uh, so, and like the thing is that if you are really uncertain about the situation, that doesn't mean that you, that gives you luxury to just sit back and, and, and relax. Uh, because like imagine if you're on, on a plane and now uh, there's an announcement that 40% of uh, people or experts, aviation experts, that think that uh, this plane is going to crash uh, if it takes off. Uh, but don't worry, like 60% think that, uh, uh, that it's going to be okay. I'm not actually using those percentages, uh, not coincidentally. That was the result of a survey last year uh, of published AI experts, and 40% now think that this is a serious issue, uh, the superintelligence control problem. Uh, so like, if there's an announcement like that on a plane, you already know what to do. You shouldn't take off. Yeah, people are going to freak out, right? Yeah. So it's like, uh, like it's just like we will never get to the situation where 100% where of AI researchers say that okay, this is serious thing, uh, because like um, yeah, Eliezer Rutkowski wrote this wonderful essay recently called "There is no fire alarm in AI." The the idea is that the point of fire alarm isn't what people think. It's not the purpose of fire alarm going off isn't to inform people that there might be fire. The purpose of fire alarm going off is to create common knowledge that there might be fire. So, so not just saying that there might be fire, but saying that, uh, like, making people know that other people know that there might be fire. So it's now okay to act as if there was a fire. It's likely that we will never get such situation with, with AI. So that there will always be these centers who say that like, this is never going to happen. It's sort of like the frog in the boiling water. If you throw a frog into boiling water, it jumps out because it's hot. But if the water boils with a frog in it, uh, it just sort of cooks. Yeah, and uh, like in, in technology, we have had actually similar situations before. Like, when uh, heavier than air flight, the Wil uh, Wilbur Wilson, bro Wilson brothers? <laughs> I might uh, mix it up. The Wright brothers. Wright brothers, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if he when heavier than air flight was uh, 500 years away, it felt like it's 500 years away. When it was five years away, it still felt like it's, it's, it's like five, 500 years away. When it had already happened, many people still thought that it's 500 years away. So, so we have ex experience with things like that. There are nuclear weapons. Like, like after, after the um, uh, first test of nuclear weapons, the nuclear weapons seemed like an impossibility. In fact, um, Ernst Rutherford uh, dismissed nuclear weapons as uh, moonshine just 24 hours before they were invented. Right. So, uh, so like people, 
humanity doesn't have a great track record saying that something technological doesn't happen. Yeah, so prediction is, prediction is tough. So let's, let's take for granted that this is going to happen, and let's say that it's going to happen at some point in, 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 the, in the nearest future. Can, is it fair to say, you know, 100 years with a 50% probability? I mean, I, I'm, like, okay, one thing that you have to uh, kind of qualify is that, uh, uh, like, pro, like, probability condition on other disasters. Uh, because like, I do think that there's a, there's a significant probability that humanity will never create AI, human-level AI. But unfortunately, it means that we screw up in some other way, that, that we destroy civilization or perhaps see species using some other methods, such as synthetic biology. But conditional that we will not do that, and the civilization will uh, kind of, uh, continue to exist. Uh, myself, I would give significantly higher probability uh, during, the last, during the next uh, century than, than 50%. My 50% right now is in about uh, 25 years or so. Oh, okay. So let's take, let's take that as an assumption that we make about when things are going to happen. If that's the case, um, how should we be thinking about this? Because um, it seems to me that before we can start to think about safety around something that's so abstract, we need to, ha to essentially have a framework through which to consider it. Mm -hmm. And I think and most people tend to think that that framework is a philosophical one. So maybe can you talk about how we should be starting this conversation amongst mm -hmm. um, people working in this space um, and, yeah, so and, and I think those that who want to? There's like a really interesting and, uh, and fertile intersection between philosophy and uh, computer science right now. Uh, people who are kind of thinking about algorithms, thinking about agents in general, uh, while being informed about uh, philosophical considerations, things like uh, anthropic principle uh, and uh, like how should we think about multiverse, th things like that. Because like, like one way of putting it is that uh, imagine if we still had the understanding of, of the world that, that is composed of four elements, like fire, uh, earth, air, and what was the fourth one? I Water. Forget. Water. Uh, then like, and if we try to using that uh, knowledge uh, to create an AI, like we will and try to explain to AI what is a good future that we want to uh, that we want it to create using those four elements. I mean, would would just get a random outcome uh, because right. like the, this, our ontology is just completely screwed up. And more realistically, if you hadn't realized that the quantum quantum physics is a thing, we we still were in Newtonian. Uh, under, our philosophical understanding is that we are living in a Newtonian world. Uh, we still would be able to create computers uh, and uh, possibly make them really powerful. But if you, if you tried to uh, wire in a basic ontology of Newtonian physics uh, into an AI that then discovers that, wait a minute, we are actually not in a Newtonian uh, world, we're going to have what is known in philosophy as ontological crisis. And uh, this is like one of the another, like, really deep examples. I know a friend of mine is, is doing uh, actually his phys uh, philosophy PhD on this topic. That's really relevant to AI, uh, right. AI future. The other, the other term that gets thrown around, which is slightly heady, is coherent extrapolated volition. Mm -hmm. um, could you, you're going to explain it better than I will, so maybe you could just quickly tell us what, what that is and why we should be thinking about it. Right, so um, the overarching term uh, for what we need to do uh, in, in order to ensure a good future with AI is called value alignment. Um, like kind of once we admit that we can't, probably we can't control something that is superhumanly intelligent. Uh, a friend of mine says that uh, uh, if you are a superhuman AI waking up in its box that, that has been built by humans, it's like a human waking up in a prison that has been built by a bunch of blind five-year-olds who know nothing about prisons nor vision. Right. Uh, so uh, if you don't will not have the ability to control superhuman AI. We have to ensure uh, that it's so-called value aligned. What it means is that uh, its idea of good future is identical to what our idea of good future is, uh, or more importantly, what it should be. Because we know that, that over time, uh, has, humanity has gone through uh, things like uh, uh, moral evolution, like we, we have had like insights, like uh, uh, Rawls, for example, last century uh, had these like wonderful insights, things like um, uh, veil of ignorance, for example, uh, the principle of common good. Uh, so the uh, like 
we are clearly evolving. Like, so, so we shouldn't like, fix our current values uh, or our current idea of what the good future is. So we should basically take one step back and define our fu good future as something that we would want if we were uh, smarter, if we were uh, kind of more coherent, more uh, kind of like better. Yeah, like yeah, more coherent, more uh, consistent mm. uh, in in what we want, and that's basically is called uh, coherent or extrapolate evolution. Again, another philosophical term. Right. So I want to talk about. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, there's been a couple of questions about Neuralink. Um, you gave me a good analogy backstage that uh, essentially trying to um, create a, a link between um, an AI and a human brain uh, in the way that Neuralink is trying to do is sort of like trying to uh, compare horses to um, supercars and saying we just need you know, a horse with a stronger rope. Yeah, the, the exact quote was uh, by a friend of mine who is an uh, economist at George Mason University, Robin Hanson. He said that like, trying to make uh, humans Competitive with computers is just like using neural interfaces is like uh, trying to make uh, horses competitive with cars by developing stronger ropes. Right. That m much more well said than, than I did. So we, we have a minute left. Um, what resources should people here be thinking about looking at if they are interested in AI as, as a field of study and ensuring that we don't all kill ourselves? Yeah, you, you, you can go to uh, Future of Life Institute, uh, futureoflife.org, for example, and there are like plenty of materials, uh, uh, not just in, in AI risk, but, uh, uh, but other, other potential existential risks that you can kind of look at. What is the state of the field? And in general, I do think there's, uh, there's going to be like a massive shortage of talent. Uh, we have gone from like, what I call reputational bottlenecks. People were not just taking it seriously when they talked about AI and other technological developments as uh, existential risks. Then we had uh, like a period of financial constraints, and these are being l largely lifted now. There are more and more uh, interest in, in uh, uh, potential funders to, to uh, actually invest in these areas. Uh, and now we're going to have a talent bottleneck. We need, as I say, we need to make AI safety sexy. Uh, right. I had a conversation with an AI developer who said that, like, okay, I'm now completely sold that I need to stop uh, like doing my own current work and start focusing on AI safety. But like, I get so much recognition when I do uh, AI capabilities research. Like, if I push the boundary a little bit, like, I get like applause all around. And if I just expect, like, if I do AI safety research, uh, people will go like, okay. That's competent, and then they, they just uh, uh, right. move on. So, like, we need to make AI safe to sexy. That's that's one. Got thing. it. So the takeaway is, if you're you're thinking about AI, you're in school, you're doing AI as a startup, you should also be thinking about the safety um, concerns, um, and uh, and perhaps consider moving into that field. So we are out of time. I'd like to thank you all for waking up early and, and listening to Jan and I or Jan talk, um, and and, uh, and I hope you have a rest, uh, a nice rest of your slush. So thank you for for joining us. Thank you very much.